Well, welcome and thank you for joining Mirantis and Entrust for today's webinar, Security Hardening for Containerized Deployments Across Multi-Clouds. My name is Juan Asenjo and I look after product marketing here at Entrust and I'll be your moderator for today's session. So before we start, I have a few uh, brief housekeeping items. Uh, first, uh, today's session is being recorded and will be made available for on-demand replay from our company's uh, respective uh, websites. Second, uh, during the presentation, we'll have some polling questions that are designed to uh, get a better feel for your needs. Um, you can uh, respond to the polls right from the webinar platform, and we much appreciate your participation in making this a more engaging session. And third, um, if you have any questions during the session, we ask that you type these in the questions feature of the webinar platform, and we'll address questions at the end. So with that, if we go to the next slide, let me introduce our main speakers today, uh, Kevin Eng and Oli Wei. Kevin is a solutions architect at Mirantis, where he focuses on DevOps practices for continuous testing and release automation for excellence in software delivery. And Ollie is technical sales consultant at Entrust and has over 20 years experience in cryptography and hardware security modules and networking. So welcome, Kevin and Ollie, and we look forward to your presentation. We go to the next slide uh, for today's uh, session. Uh, we'll start off with a brief uh, introduction to containers and Kubernetes, focusing on the benefits uh, for DevOps. Uh, from there, we'll go a little deeper into the container deployment pipeline and describe the, the main uh, security challenges that are faced by customers, including architectural challenges such as uh, cryptographic key generation and management and the use of third-party multi-cloud compute resources. We'll then look at the DevOps challenges, including digital signing of container images and Kubernetes secrets management. And we'll highlight where high assurance security is required, including software supply chain, uh, container image storage and governance and compliance. And underscore the value that security then brings to these. And finally, we'll close with a focus on how Entrust and Mirantis uh, can help customers enhance security and facilitate regulatory compliance. So with this, uh, let's get started with an introduction to containers and Kubernetes. So if we go to the next slide, uh, containers are really you know, small, well-defined chunks of, or modules of, of software code. Uh, they are the architectural choice for today's forward-thinking uh, IT deployments and really a natural choice for microservices. Uh, they offer strong isolation and enable easy and effective scaling, uh, providing version migration and high availability. And containers are characterized by their portability. They uh, can be spun up from a developer laptop to a test environment or from a staging environment into production or from a physical machine in a data center to a, a virtual machine in a public or uh, private cloud. Now, if we go to the next slide, Kubernetes, on the other hand, are what keeps track of containerized applications that are deployed into the cloud. Uh, they essentially orchestrate the process of uh, restarting uh, orphanage containers. They shut down containers that are not being used, and they um, automatically provision resources like the memory, storage, and CPU uh, when necessary to keep things running smoothly. Now, um, modern um, application uh, development, if we go to the next slide, uses uh, containers and Kubernetes to standardize software design and really facilitate continuous integration and continuous delivery. The process uh, enables developers to deploy new applications with the assurance that they uh, will run reliably in, um, in any user environment. And Kubernetes, uh, container platforms enables uh, development, testing, staging, and production teams to work in a, in a common environment. Uh, they provide a, a foundation for delivery of applications anywhere, uh, allow dynamic uh, containerized application deployments, and enable transparent security and key management. 
and really uh, also reduce IT operational costs through um, application portability. Uh, containers can benefit from security hardening, and that is really the main topic that we will cover today. So uh, with this brief introduction, um, I'm going to turn it over now to Kevin to go a little deeper into the application development and uh, operation pipeline process and its uh, security considerations. Kevin? Um, yeah, thanks Juan. So let's, if we put these all together and look at what a, a typical pipeline would look like, a deployment and operations pipeline, it's probably not too different to what you're currently ex experiencing if you are uh, practicing traditional application deployment methods without containerization. And in the process, essentially it starts from the left side where our developers uh, creates new code and checks in the code into your source code management. Now the difference, here's where this difference kind of comes into play between traditional deployment and containerized deployment and that you're no longer working with application artifacts as instead you are now working with a containerized uh, package. Uh, so what we call it an image that you then deploy onto your environments. So you'll have your continuous integration process build your container images uh, you'll store that into a registry or a number of repositories where you want to make sure that they are secure. And this is where the sign scanning promotion process we'll talk about a bit later on comes into play. And then through the Kubernetes orchestration, deploy that onto your various environments into the actual container runtimes. Once you have that there, then your operation teams look at, you know, we're going to make sure there's an environment for you to deploy to. And also, once it's in uh, production, what are its performances? And you want to feed that back into both your operation side and your development side for true DevOps fashion so that everybody essentially knows what's going on. So as you can see there, there's a quite a, a few um, integration points. And there's a lot of communications going through. Various parties are, are touching the system. Uh, various integrations and communications are going throughout. How do we keep them secure? And that's going to be our, our topic for the next uh, little while here. Um, so if we look at this and, and think about the different aspects that uh, Juan has covered off a bit earlier, we can almost look at this and break up the security challenges into two um, distinct sections. We may have starting with the architectural security side of things and perhaps DevOps security side of things. And uh, let's start with the architectural security uh, part of it. And Ali, I'll pass it over to you uh, to cover some of that, and then I'll, I'll cover off the DevOps security um, aspect of, uh, of our talk here. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so on the, the architectural side, um, there are certain challenges that are, are common to um, legacy and, and also more modern um, architecture. Uh, and then there are other things that are introduced by um, a change in, in um, uh, architecture or the uh, location where a workloads are being run uh, in a more uh, modern arrangement in, in cloud and uh, sometimes subcontracted um, uh, compute resources. I'll, I'll go into to more details on the uh, the next slide, but um, uh, underpinning uh, these and, and what's been the case for uh, many, many years is certain applications or organizations um, have a focus on compliance that um, it is necessary for, for them to design and run uh, applications in a way that is uh, uh, satisfactory to their um, uh, auditors or, or indeed the um, uh, the industry uh, regulations that they, they operate within. Yeah, and, and if you think about now, we take that also onto the actual application workload and we even your process side of things. This is where your DevOps security comes into play. When you're when you're practicing DevSecOps, your security really should, shouldn't be an afterthought and it really shouldn't be a hindrance as well because that's if you think about this, the barrier to entry for security in a lot of um, organizations, and that is, you know, security is hard and it's getting in the way of of, um, of application development and bringing value. So, you know, things such as once you have your application de developed, how do you ensure that your image is actually secure or even authentic? Um, and then when you start orchestrating the workloads into your environments, how do you ensure that, you know, the the actual orchestration is secure. Um, secrets are being passed around 
um, securely and not being exposed to the wild. We, we've all seen those horror stories where you open up a, um, let's say, a S3 bucket and all the passwords are over there, right? And then, you know, last but not least, the making sure that your your folks can actually access the development environment, the orchestration, or even the workloads um, without having to go through complex steps of setting up identity access management. You know, who is allowed to access what, um, where, all that needs to be taken, taken into consideration when we're looking at the DevOps security. So I guess let's go and, and, and dive a little bit deeper into some of these points. And uh, let's go ahead and start with the first architectural uh, security challenge here. Thanks, Kevin. Now, some applications need to use specialist hardware for, for cryptography, um, particularly those working in regulated industries um, or supporting critical national infrastructure. Um, in the past, that meant um, limitations, perhaps, in terms of, of how they were deployed, um, having to run on certain platforms, uh, including or physically connected to something called a hardware security module. Uh, Juan will explain what this is uh, later on. Uh, these days, we want to be able to deploy these kind of applications in a more modern situation. Um, that is to say, following cloud and container philosophy, um, but still ensure that the crucial cryptography is occurring in certified and tamper resistant hardware. And there could be various reasons why this is desirable. Valuable keys mean adversaries are potentially highly motivated and well resourced to attack systems. And in other cases, it's a mandatory arrangement to be part of a scheme such as financial transaction processing. Or else it could be stipulated simply by organizational policy or audit requirements to follow NIST standards. Uh, next slide, please. And now we talk about some of the, the newer challenges uh, brought about by changes in the way that applications are run. It used to be that you'd know exactly where your application code was running uh, and who indeed might have access to that server or virtual machine. And typically there'd be people uh, part of your own organization. Later on, you could inspect logs locally uh, to determine who'd done what when. But now there's much more abstraction. Applications run on generic compute resource, which could be external to your organization. And this is great in terms of flexibility and scalability, but it's much harder to know who's got privileged access to the infrastructure. In a lot of cases, there'd be people outside your organization who have capabilities to copy data from memory, which could include key material used for encryption. And likely you won't have access to logs directly. It might not even be possible to acquire or rely on those provided by third parties, especially if there's multiple layers involved in the outsourcing for providing this infrastructure. And using a hardware security module to isolate and protect the key material in the same way as the applications who absolutely require it can significantly reduce the risk of it being exposed or captured. You know, now onto the, the actual application workload as well, right? So Ollie's uh, outlined some of the architectural challenges of executing your code onto on public cloud and um, making sure that you're able to uh, securely access those environments. But at the same time, if you look at this, the current slide over here, these are just some of the news items that I pulled from the past year in terms of um, vulnerabilities that are out there in the containerized world, right? You have scenarios where you've got actual Docker Hub engineers have, uh, having critical vulnerabilities. And we know that you know, the benefit of using containerization, one of the major benefits is the, the, um, the speed at which you could actually set up your development and production environments because there are pre-built images out there that all your dependencies are uh, already handled. But at the same time, how do you know that they're secure because they're someone else's images essentially? And you have to trust that there is uh, a vetting process that ensures everything is handled. And at the same time, making sure that the images that you're using is also authentic and vetted by your own security processes. And when you start looking at some of the other environments, you know, you, folks are starting to um, uh, target Windows containers. And also in terms of configuration, even with your orchestration and Kubernetes, um, just, I think this is in the past months, um, we found that nearly a million instances of Kubernetes uh, deployments are actually exposed. So this is a configuration thing. And Kubernetes, while powerful, let, let's face it, is actually quite complex in, in certain instances because there are so many things to go through. The flexibility actually adds on to the things that you have to look out for. So you want to make sure that when you're deploying your Kubernetes uh, instances, 
that it is a secure in terms of the communication, but also configured to a way that there is no exposed um, instances or uh, vulnerabilities that ex exposed out to the wild. And let me dig a little bit deeper into the Kubernetes security side of things. Now, when you look at this, uh, this next slide over here, this is a, a very high level Kubernetes architecture. We have our Kubernetes server um, on the top left over here, which is kind of the, the, um, the management uh, area that connects to all of your different worker uh, workload uh, nodes on the outside. And as you can see over here, the integration points between the few, right? You have your communication between your servers and your uh, workloads. You have the communication between your actual developers and the uh, API servers within Kubernetes. And you have communication between the users and your workers. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of attack vectors over here. And what we want to make sure is that all of these are uh, patched up and there are no chances for man in the middle attacks and or um, uh, any exposed surfaces where pe people could just come in and gain access to your API server because essentially once they have that, they have access to your entire environment. Right. So these are things that we're gonna be looking at as well. And we'll look at some practical uh, uh, scenarios and examples of how um, interest and brands is gonna work together to help you secure your environments here. It's possible with uh, Enshield HSMs and, and using our container option pack um, to very straightforwardly use this modern uh, contemporary uh, containerized architecture um, and enable all of the operations best practice that, that goes along with it, um, as well as ensuring that regulatory compliance uh, for applications that need certified and high, high assurance um, cryptographic hardware. The point is that these really important applications don't have to be left behind uh, on the path to a containerized deployment um, and realizing all of those operational benefits that, that go along with it. It's possible also to consider uh, keeping other valuable keys out of shared or, or unknown general purpose compute uh, by using the same approach. So over to you, Kevin. All right, thanks, Holly. And so if you think back to some of the other things that we talked about earlier as well, and what Ranthus we provide is an end-to-end -end secure software supply chain, and that involves the, um, the container images uh, onto the orchestration of those images onto your uh, uh, your environments, be it test, uh, pre-prod, or production, and a runtime. And also, once it's out in the, in the production, we also provide uh, monitoring capabilities and deployment capabilities for those environments, so that uh, your all of your folks are able to see exactly what's going on with not only the um, environment performance, the Kubernetes and container runtime performance, but also how your application is impacting those uh, environments once it's out there. Uh, in terms of the individual security of the runtime and also the orchestration, uh, we are FIPS 140-2 validated. And in terms of the communication, so everything is encrypted uh, to uh, governmental standards. And at the same time, the configuration, we are aligned to uh, the Department of Information and Security uh, STIGs. So this is a list of configuration to your uh, runtime and Kubernetes so that you don't have to worry about the configuration side of things as well, making sure that it is secure out of the box. Um, and like I said, at the very bottom will be here, your image scanning, signing, and promotion process, because you wanna make sure that uh, your images are authentic and there are no issues going along the way right so let's go into some of the um, the more details on the entrust platform and how that helps with security so this is looking at the, the workflow for building and scaling containers developers can uh, build images uh, using our security world software and the container option pack um, that make those applications uh, ready to use the, the Enshield hardware security module. The Kubernetes engine uh, from Arantis provides the tools to test and deploy those containerized applications, taking away some of the complexities of the, the Kubernetes layer. Those applications are able to use cryptographic services provided by the hardware security module for doing operations such as encryption, decryption, signing or verification of uh, digital signatures. 
the HSMs that they're, they're connecting to can either be on premise or provided uh, as a service. Uh, and this hardware based cryptography is concealing the uh, sensitive key material from any observation or extraction by other processes, um, people managing the platform, uh, or um, uh, functions available for uh, uh, any third parties with that, uh, with that access. The applications can fully uh, take advantage of uh, this more modern architecture and scale when needed uh, easily and in an automated fashion. Thanks to the combination of uh, Kubernetes uh, and the Enshield security world architecture. Well, thank you, Oli. Uh, so uh, you've, learned, you've noticed that uh, you know Oli has mentioned uh, a few times the the hardware security module. So for those that are not fully familiar with an HSM, uh, these are uh, specialized appliances that operate uh, independently of applications and typically attached to the network to guard the keys. Uh, that are used by applications and also perform cryptographic operations on behalf of those applications. Uh, applications can live uh, on pre premise or in the cloud, and uh, HSMs, for that matter, can also be um, on prem or actually be as a service. Uh, the point is that uh, critical keys are, are isolated from the host environment and are always protected uh, inside the device so that the security domain is segregated from the rest of the system. And, uh, you know, HSMs also implement uh, defined security policies and uh, access to the security domain is enforced with dual controls that require mutual uh, supervision. So what this means is that no single individual can change security policies. And uh, as a result, uh, HSMs uh, are considered uh, a best practice. Uh, and these devices are also typically certified to the federal information processing standard and also the common criteria, uh, which are the two most common uh, widely recognized standards for cryptographic uh, robustness. And essentially what they do is that they uh, integrate and operationalize security uh, across uh, the different applications that they are supporting. So now in the context of uh, containerized applications, Kevin, can you uh, elaborate on the security of these deployments? Yeah, absolutely. Think about this, and one, and Ollie, correct me if I'm wrong over here, if I'm understanding this, your, your HSMs then kind of act as your keys and locks to your, your secure data or your applications. Right, so this way we're having that you make sure that only you and your know, what your organization can control is these policies, and only you can actually open it up to uh, to to manage these and um, encrypt and or decrypt that information. Does that sound about right? Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, essentially what the HSM is doing. Perfect. Yeah. So if you think about it from that context, then now we have the keys and locks over here. If we look at the the architecture and the infrastructure side of things, you know a lot of organizations are doing a great job of securing infrastructure. Uh, however, there are going to be cases like Ollie mentioned earlier that the infrastructure is not entirely within your control and it may be out on the public cloud. And this is where having HSMs will be able to make sure that you know what you're executing over there is going to be secure. But if you look at the entire pipeline over here, as as we go back onto the DevOps side of things. Um, a lot of organizations probably fall into two different categories when they're securing the infrastructure. They either, those are that are unaware that their clusters are insecure, or those that know they're insecure, but don't know where to start. So if you look at Kubernetes, there's a couple different areas we could help with securing them, right? One, you wanna secure the cluster, the underlying infrastructure and the admin tools. And then with the assistant of HSM as well, um, you can now have further control uh, of these processes. And when you look at the clusters, these are going to be your runtimes, your orchestration, and all the admin tools that the people are touching into how to configure your orchestration and also your platform. Uh, two, you want to control access by keeping out unauthorized people and workloads. Uh, three, provide a secure software development process that allows developers uh, to build and improve software quickly, but only consuming the appropriate components. Uh, so that kind of prevents the malicious execution or even erroneous execution of untrusted workloads on your clusters. 
and you want to build a SecOps culture that adopts all these best coding practices, architectural patterns, and so on, to make your environment as soon as uh, as secure as possible. So, if we look into the, um, let's start with the secure DevOps process and the image uh, uh, promotion process. Right. What you want to make sure is your images. First of all, whatever base image you're pulling uh, from the your hub or your repository is actually secure to start off with. Second, you want to make sure that only those that you've vetted is able to be deployed onto your um, environments. And third, you want to make sure that the exact same image is being deployed into your individual test environments from one to the other. So you know that when you're in an upper environment, you're testing exactly the same thing as the ones that you're doing in your test environments. So this is where the container image security capabilities Mantis comes in play. Um, we provide your, your policy and promotion processes of your images, um, but even more important, once it comes in, you start with scanning the images. So this uh, essentially goes through all of the different layers of your container images, uh, matches it up with a, a vulnerabilities database, the common uh, vulnerabilities and exposures database, to not only know and identify any vulnerabilities that are in your container images, but at the same time also provide remediation if available on what to do. So if I find something like a log4j vulnerability, what do we do to remediate it and how do I update it moving forward? Um, we are able to store your images in the local environment so that you now have full control of your container images. You're not dependent on the third party uh, when you need to update or when you need to deploy. Uh, we're able to provide things such as caching and mirroring so that you have um, high availability and dis disaster recovery if needed. Um, now, when you're going through, um, we also manage your life cycle of the images. So have your image come in, scan it. Uh, if it matches, uh, let's say, for example, I don't have any high vulnerability items in here, I could go ahead and promote that. Um, we have image signing, which then uh, ensures the authenticity of your image, and we can set up the the uh, runtime to only run those that have been signed, um, and so this way only approved images can be executed in your production or even pre-production environments, so no vulnerabilities are out there in the wild. And then only those that are allowed access can gain access to the policies and promotion um, configuration image storage through built-in access control. Now, once you have the image secured, we then want to look at the orchestration side of things. How do we ensure that um, our environment, A, is secure, and B, it's configured to a way that is um, industry standard and to the highest uh, level of security that's available? And this is where the Mirantis Kubernetes engine comes into play. So we know, you know, Kubernetes, to start off with, there's a lot of things to, to look out for. You have, you know, anybody can stand up Kubernetes really quickly. Um, and you deploy workloads to it. But once you start looking at the day two activities or even the more secure setups, there are other things you need to look out for, such as what is our network process gonna look like? How do I ensure I have secure ingress um, into my application? Is, is there, do I need load balancing? Do I need to control traffic? And so on and so forth. Who has access to configure my orchestration and my Kubernetes environments? Well, we need to make sure that um, role-based access control your identity access management, all that is being set up. So with the Kubernetes engine, all this is taken care of for you. We have everything out of the box. So all you need to do is go ahead and configure them and, and add, add in your own organization's um, users and perhaps some policies in there. And you don't have to build everything from scratch. And the term that we use is, you know, we got batteries included, but it's swappable. So if you have your own ingress controllers, if you have your own IDM access and, and the RBAC processes, we could go ahead and swap them out and connect that into the Kubernetes engine so that it's gonna fit your processes as opposed to having um, to make you jump through hoops to configure everything out of the box. We go to the next slide. Uh, today's uh, fast-paced uh, containerized application deployment environment uh, needs uh, robust security. Uh, security challenges uh, include both uh, architectural and uh, DevOps aspects. 
and the need for robust uh, cryptography is really at the core of these uh, security requirements to ensure that that security is uh, built into these processes. And we saw how uh, Entrust uh, certified hardware security modules uh, complement uh, Mirantis Kubernetes uh, uh, engine to really uh, enable cryptographic uh, key management to run transparently and thus uh, harden uh, the application and, and facilitate uh, auditing and compliance uh, with regulations. So this uh, brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, and at this time, uh, we can take uh, your questions. Uh, remember that you can still submit them through the questions uh, tab um, on your uh, presentation platform. So I'm going to monitor that. Um, and I have a first question here. Um, what are the main advantages of containers over virtual machines. And um, I think, Ollie, do you, do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, containers are, are much more lightweight. Um, they, they start up faster since there's no extra operating system that has to be loaded. Um, and then because you don't have to manage the, the virtual machine configuration or, or worry about patching, uh, then there's a massive simplification in, in terms of your, your operations. Uh, upgrading these is uh, you know just a matter of uh, launching some new ones and, and taking away the old ones, um, which can happen in a, an automated or semi-automated fashion. Um, and, and rolling back in, in case of problems is, is again, very straightforward. So they're, they're mostly benefits on the, the operational side. Turns out that um, being able to, to scale your, your applications up and down um, is, is really very, very easy. That's um, you know, just uh, telling the system how many uh, of something you want and, and they'll go and they'll be provisioned. Uh, and it's much, much um, less effort than uh, deploying, configuring, managing uh, uh, virtual machines. Okay, thank you, Oli. And I have another one here. Uh, do we expect new security challenges to emerge as more management tools become available for containerized uh, application deployment? Uh, Kevin, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's interesting because I think uh, new security challenges will always be in place. Uh, let's face it, um, there are always going to be um, malicious actors out there. And I think the idea behind this is really, there's there's two things, right? Once you wanna kind of reduce the complexity of your management um, environment. So having a unified and simplified kind of visibility into all of your different, um, let's start with Kubernetes, right? Your different clusters, managing all of those in a, sim, uh, a, a single uh, management console and also your role-based access controls, all of your identity assets management, if you have them all in a single place, you're now ensuring that you're not gonna miss out on any items that you need to configure uh, when you're going through and locking down your systems. And at the same time, you also wanna provide a robust uh, process of keeping up to date with some of the vulnerabilities and challenges that come up as well. So. You know, you have your environment locked down, but now with your application workloads, you want to make sure that your uh, scanning rules, let's say, for example, are updated. Your processes are continuously updated. And this is where the DevSecOps idea of continuous improvement comes into play, where when you have a, uh, a stable environment, um, then you can look at continuous improvement on what are the new challenges that are coming out, and then coming up with remediation steps to actually uh, cover those um, those vulnerabilities moving forward. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, and uh, one more question here: Can you elaborate on uh, how HSMs facilitate compliance? And, uh, I, you know, I can take that one. So, uh, HSMs, uh, as I described, uh, they establish and they uh, delineate how security uh, policies are applied and enforced. And they do this by moving uh, sensitive uh, cryptographic key material to a dedicated environment. Uh, and this is uh, the, the FIPS approved environment of the HSM, which lives uh, away from the IT infrastructure. And uh, in this way, the HSM automates uh, a lot of burden uh, and error prone uh, key management tasks um, and establishes a way that lets you set a clear way to show auditors how security is being implemented. And this obviously then facilitates uh, regulatory compliance. So we're coming uh, to the top of the hour. So um, that's really uh, our time for today. 
thank you for watching and uh, thanks uh, to our speakers, uh, Kevin and Ollie, for sharing your expertise and insight. Uh, on behalf of Mirantis and Entrust, we trust that you found this uh, session to be informative. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time out of your schedules to join us. Uh, and um, so long for now, and we wish you uh, a great uh, rest of your day.